week on Bowling World, an up-close look at near perfection, the story of world record holder Tom Jordan. And the long road back from injury, will Rick Steelsmith succeed? This week, we feature Donna Adamek. As we look at Donna, that she does what she has to do to win. Donna Adamek skyrocketed in her youth from high school bowler of the year to collegiate champion to pro champion. And the mighty might is still going strong. Adamek is acknowledged by her fellow pros and fans as one of the best clutch bowlers of all time. Included in the seven titles she won in the 1980s are two sparkling jewels, the Bowling Proprietors Association of America U.S. Open and the Women's International Bowling Congress Queens Tournament. A hard worker on and off the lanes, she was sidelined often during the decade, but still managed to earn more than a quarter of a million dollars. She was named the Bowler of the Year in 1980 and in 81. Small in stature, Adamek always amazed fans with the sharp finishing ball she rolled and her amazing control. Don't forget, if you think Donna Adamek is the bowler of the 80s, you'll have an opportunity to vote for her a little later on here in December. Coming up next, the long and arduous journey back for Rick Steelsmith. One thing is for certain, there are always ups and downs in life, but they don't often come so close together. Not so, though, for Rick Steelsmith, a young and talented player with a can't-miss tag. But there have been some roadblocks, as our Bob Dolan reports. From April of 87 to April of 88, Rick Steelsmith had a year he'll always remember. Led his college team, Wichita State, to the national championship. Won two gold medals at the FIQ Worlds in Helsinki. Won the ABC Bud Light Masters, the first amateur in 37 years to win that title. And then capped it off by joining the Pro Tour and winning the 88 PBA Rookie of the Year Award. That year to remember was followed, though, by a year he'd like to forget. Now, Rick Steelsmith is making a comeback. That's right, at the age of 25, he's been forced to start over, to come back from a shoulder injury and then surgery, which has kept him off the tour for over a year. He first started practicing again back in April. It was kind of scary the first few shots I threw. Not really, this is going to happen again, but I was just apprehensive because I didn't know what was going to happen. I, I hadn't been through anything like that before, so I didn't know what to expect. And, and there was still some soreness from the surgery when I went out and bowled. And uh, I was real apprehensive the first few shots. I took it very, very easy and just tried to go through the motions real smooth and easy and uh, kind of build up slowly from there. I'm sure all athletes in any sport realize that injuries might happen. But still, when it does happen, does it catch you off guard? Does it knock you back? Definitely. It's a, a lot more devastating than I thought it would be. It's real, real frustrating. It's been a very tough year for me. And uh, I've learned quite a bit, of, bit from it, though. Uh, it's, it's real easy when things are going well and, and you're not even thinking about injuries. It's real easy to kind of take your talent for granted, I guess. And uh, I've learned through that, through the injury, to, to work hard again. And, and the rehabilitation has been a lot of hard work and a lot of hours each day. And uh, it's, been, it's been a frustrating road, but it, it's starting to, starting to look good now again. I think you have to go through something like this to really understand everything that's involved. And uh, just the mental strain and, and stress from being off from the sport that you love for so long and being away from the competition and in a sense sometimes wondering if you're ever going to get back. You know, those kind of thoughts go through your mind and, and it's been very, very tough to deal with. The hardest times were the days that it would hurt or the days before I had the surgery that I'd go out and bowl after it felt good for a couple weeks and I'd bowl and it would hurt. And those were the hard times to deal with because then it was kind of, is this ever going to get any better? Am I ever going to be able to go out and compete at the level that I did before? And those kind of thoughts just are, are very frustrating. The injury and the surgery has prompted Steelsmith to make an important change in his delivery, as many fans will notice it the first time they see him. His high backswing, one that most pros only dream about, has been lowered. Before the injury and the surgery, my backswing was pretty much vertical. It was almost 12 o'clock, if you were to look at it in that aspect. And uh, after the surgery and after, after the injury, I've worked on lowering that for my own 
uh, my own good feelings, I think, just to, to have that good feeling about it. And it's probably a little bit above the, the top of my head, maybe, right around in that area. And that took some time to get used to, too, because it was a lot different timing with each step. The ball was in a different position. Steel Smith will rejoin the Pro Tour this fall. He says he'll enter two or three of the fall events, and he's going to take it pretty slow to begin with. He'll take some very high hopes with him, but a very deep fear as well. I would think anytime somebody's coming back from an injury, in the back of your mind, there has to be a thought that I'm never going to be quite the same as I was. Do you ever think that? That thought's definitely gone through my mind, as I'm sure it's gone through any injured player's mind. Uh, and that's something for me right now, I think the way that I need to deal with that is not concentrate on what I, the way I used to be, but concentrate on the way that I am now and, and the way that I want to be. This is Bob Dolan reporting for Bowling World. We're happy to report some good news concerning Rick Steelsmith's comeback. Recently, he teamed with Justin Romick to win Richard Altman's mag doubles in Edmond, Oklahoma. Steelsmith averaged 200 plus on tough lane conditions rolling against magnesium pins. And aside from a little stiffness in the old shoulder, the former ABC Masters champion is looking forward to returning to the PBA Fall Tour this season. How many times have you hit the pocket and left a solid tap? Next on Texan Specs, the proper angle of entry into the pocket for greater pin carry. Bowling. It's a simple game. Round ball, throw it at 10 pins, and count how many you knock down, right? Right. Simple. Unless you want to play the game well and score high. Now, the secret of becoming a good bowler is throwing strikes. And the secret of throwing strikes is putting the ball in the pocket between the one and three pin. Right? Right. Ever throw a shot you felt was dead solid in the pocket and leave a corner pin? Ever wonder why you can carry crossover hits all night long? Well. Here at the Equipment and Specifications Facility at Bowling Headquarters, the staff researches these same questions. They've discovered that hitting the pocket isn't the only secret. Your angle of entry into the pocket also determines how many strikes you can string together. Now, your angle of entry is simply the line the ball follows when it gets to the pocket. Well, really, it's simple geometry. The bigger the entry angle into the pocket, the wider the pocket becomes. Increase your hook, you increase your entry angle, increase your chance for strikes. The angle of entry is equal to the amount of hook to your ball. A hard straight shot would be about two degrees. A good hook shot would be about four degrees. And the pros that throw the big crank shots would probably be about six degrees or more. This specially designed ramp fires balls into the pins to study the impact. The ramp tests begin with a nose hit straight into the head pin and is adjusted every half inch from the range of perfect hits to misses. The ramp can throw 50 out of 50 strikes at one setting and none at another. At certain locations, what looks to be a perfect hit leaves those pesky corner pins, the sevens and tens. It can also throw perfect crossover hits 50 out of 50 times. So there's not as much luck involved as you may have thought. The tests show exactly where most strikes happen. A big hook and a high angle of entry bring more strikes. But there's no free lunch. A big hook is harder to control, and you still have to be accurate enough to get to the pocket before you worry about your angle of entry. Boom. It's a simple game, right? Now, if world record holder Tom Jordan had watched Texan Specs, he probably would have shot 900. Nevertheless, we'll be back with a near-perfect performance when we continue. Bowling Congress and League Bowling have been in existence for nearly a century. During that span of time, billions of three-game series have been rolled, but none higher than Tom Jordan's sanctioned 899, as close to perfection as anyone can get. Our Jim Micah has the story. The year was 1939. A scrappy 5'5", five 130-pound five 130 bowling machine from Lockport, New York, rolls an 886 series. It's a record that would stand unbeaten for 50 years. His name was Allie Brandt, author of what was once thought to be a record that could never be broken. Then came Tom Jordan, a 22-year-old welder from Patterson, New Jersey. Get used to that name. 
Tom Jordan will be in all the record books until someone rolls a 900. It's hard to appreciate, for myself, appreciate what I did because I didn't, I wasn't able to witness it. I did it, but I, I didn't have any time because it was a doubles league to sit there and take in all the strikes I'm throwing. Imagine rolling a three game series, ending up with an 899, two perfect games included, rolling a total of 36 balls, never having to shoot a spare. Then going on for an incredible fourth game, ending up with an 1198. And it all happened here. Garden State Bowl, Union, New Jersey. Manager Harriet Tabak witnessed history and says the evening was full of tension and excitement. It was thrilling to watch him. He throws such a nice smooth ball and he has such a nice attitude about it. Tom Jordan's accomplishment ranks with Roger Maris's 61 home runs and DiMaggio's hitting streak. Those are the words of Pat McDonough, who writes a bowling weekly in New Jersey. McDonough shares these facts with us. Eight million league bowlers who bowl 35 weeks a season have 280 million chances annually to roll an honor series like Tom Jordan's. That's how rare it is. Your chances are much better of winning a state lottery. I hardly believe it. I still can't believe it. A lot of people can't believe it either that anybody comes so close to 900 in three games and have it approved by the American Bowling Congress. Many people have bowled 900 for three games, but uh, it wasn't approved because of conditions. As the ABC secretary of Union County, New Jersey, Len said both lanes, 15 and 16, were checked for amount and distance of oil, depth of the gutters, Four pins were even sent to the ABC in Wisconsin where they were systematically dissected. End result, everything came out okay. Just for fun, Tom was issued a challenge on the same two lanes where he made history to see how many strikes he could roll in a row. Are these the balls that you use to break the record? Uh, no, this isn't the one that I used. It's a replica. The other one's in uh, St. Louis in the Hall of Fame. Okay, well, let's see how well you can do. Ready? The seven pin was left standing. It was the same pin that wouldn't fall in his 299 fourth game. In his 299 second game, the culprit was the 10 pin. By the way, if you were watching Tom's last six tosses, they were all strikes. Nothing unusual for this 22 year old who's rolled seven 300 games and five 299s. At a recent awards banquet in New Jersey, ABC president Boyd Pexton said that since 1939, there have been 4.9 billion attempts at breaking Allie Grant's record in sanctioned competition, one of the most durable records in all of sports. Would Tom like to see his record last? If I can go 50 years before it's broken, I'd be happy with that. Surrounded by dignitaries of the bowling world and flooded with the memories of his accomplishment, the crowd saluted Tom Jordan as he wept tears of joy. For Bowling World, this is Jim Micah reporting from Union County, New Jersey. It's time now for Around the Bowling World, sponsored by the Bowling Proprietors Association of America. Much has been written and said about Rick Steelsmith, the PBA Rookie of the Year who has been sidelined with a shoulder injury. Little, though, has been mentioned about Mike Jazz now, a collegiate All-America and a teammate of Steelsmith's at Wichita State. Jazz now won on the PBA Tour back in 1988, and then he too, like Steelsmith, was sidelined with arm and wrist problems. Jazz now went back home to Fishkill, New York, and worked out to overcome the injury, then made a return to regional pro action using a 15-pound ball. The climax came last month when Jazz now teamed with Lisa Scarpatti of Beechwood, New Jersey, to win the PBA Women's All-Star Association Mixed Doubles Tournament. Like Steel Smith, he's looking forward to returning to the PBA Tour come November. This week's Bowling World question comes to us from Mary Boness from Muskego, Wisconsin. Mary is a 155 average bowler at McKindo's Alpine Lanes, and she wants to know how many holes are allowed in a ball in any ABC sanctioned event. Believe it or not, a maximum of 12 holes, that's right, a dozen are possible. Five holes are allowed for gripping purposes, one vent hole for each finger or thumb, one balance hole, and one mill hole. Hmm. Thanks for your question, Mary. Winning can be rewarding, and bowling is a sport which revels in rewarding its achievers. Let's now take a look at some of the more spectacular awards guided by a man who has won most of them himself, Earl Anthony. It's a thrill to win an award in any sport, 
Over the years, great imagination has been used in developing bowling trophies and various other awards. I've been fortunate to win many championships and awards. I've seen all kinds of plaques and trophies in all sizes, shapes, and materials. They've been made of wood, granite, marble, silver, gold and diamonds, even paper, cardboard, and plastic. Pins, chevrons, medals, and trophies are as old as bowling, and there still exist many of them more than 100 years old. The medals and other awards endure. <laughs> Would you believe, in the early days of bowling, many tournaments awarded live turkeys for three strikes in a row? Treasure your trophies. Remember, if you don't have any, your day is bound to come as long as you keep bowling. I'm Earl Anthony, inviting you to enjoy the history of our sport at the National Bowling Hall of Fame and Museum. Going for the Gold is brought to you by the National Bowling Council. Today, our topic of discussion is the stance, and with me is Mike Albee to help demonstrate. Mike, we're, what we're going to do is take the body and break it into three parts. Waist down, waist up, in your case, left arm, left hand. Let's first start out in the lower body. If you notice right now, Mike's got his feet standing square, a little stiff-legged. Let's move that left leg back, Mike, about four or five inches. And the reason we do this is we're presetting the angle of the hips. Because when Mike gets up to the foul line, he's going to end up on his right leg. His right leg is forward, his left leg is back. So we're presetting that angle in the hips right here in the stance. So that's one item. Preset the angle by pulling the left foot back. If you were a right-hander, Mike, demonstrate the exact opposite for the right-hander. They'd have their right foot back. The second item of concern is in the knees. We see people all the time. They're standing very stiff and rigid like they're in attention, like they were in the Army. What we want to do is we want to take that stiffness out of the legs. Mike, demonstrate for us, if you will, how to just kink those legs, those knees, four to five inches. Now, from the knee to the ankle bone, we'll have a 15-degree angle or 15-degree tilt in the lower body. So with the lower body, we have two items of concern. Number one, preset the angle of the hips. Pull that left foot back, in Mike's case, right-hander, right foot back. Kink those knees, put a 15-degree tilt to those knees. That's all there is to it, waist down. Mike, now let's, we'll talk about waist up. Again, we have two items of concern. We want to preset the angle of the shoulders, the same as we did with the feet. So, Mike, if you would, would you put your arms out and preset that angle? The right arm is out, and you'll notice his fingers touch the middle of the palm of his right hand. He's got the left shoulder four inches behind the right shoulder. So we preset the angle of the upper body, the same as we have the lower body. That's one item of concern. Item two, Mike, would be the tilt from the tailbone to the top of the head. There it is, perfect balanced position, because we're going to go forward. So we have to tilt our body, get ready to make a series of athletic movements. So we have waist down, kink the knees, left foot back. We have waist up, shoulders open, four to five inches, tilt the spine. Now we have the third item, Mike, and that's ball position. Mike, we have bowlers that hold the ball very low, a la Marshall Holman. The reason Marshall holds the ball low is he's very fast to the foul line. So the person that's aggressive, that has that fast adrenaline, hold that ball down low, below your waist. Then we have the person that walks the line with a medium speed, a George Pappas. He's not real fast, he's not real slow. He's a medium style player, and he holds the ball around belt high or waist high. Then we have the person that holds the ball up a little higher, a la Mark Roth. He's held the ball high, gets the foul line, and gets in front of the swing to create more leverage. And Mike Albee holds the ball high. Mike, uh, explain to us why you feel is this the best position for you. Uh, my approach is fairly slow, and uh, when I had the ball lower, my ball got into my swing too quick, so my ball is always ahead of my feet. So all I did is delay the swing a little bit and get my ball to catch up with my feet. So remember, we have the three different positions of where you could hold the ball. Low, if you're one of the faster bowlers. Medium, and high, if you go to the line very slow. Now we'll be right back and talk more on the stance. Now let's review the stance. First of all, we have waist down. Mike's being left-hander, he'll pull his left foot back. Kink the knees, 15 degrees from the knee to the ankle. Waist up, we have left shoulder back. We have from the tailbone to the top of the head tilted forward 15 degrees. Now we have ball position. We have a very low ball position for the fast player. Instead of only three positions, now let's break that into five. For you more advanced players, you can fine tune your own game. 
Now let's bring it up between the waist and the low position. We call this the medium fast position. Waist high now for the medium player. Now we have the medium slow player, and we have the slow player that holds the ball very high. So go to your local bowling center and try the five different positions and choose which one is best suited for your game. It's time now to take a look at the bright lights and highlights around the world of bowling. The latest stop on the LPBT was the Brunswick Open at Olympia Lanes in Hammond, Indiana. And in the first match, Alita Sill hit five in a row after a first frame open and beat Lori Nichols, 246-223. Donna Adamick was waiting in match number two. Adamick has been red hot. She's been in three of the last four championship rounds. And this strike in the ninth gave her the lead for good. Adamick, 193, Alita Sill, 190. So it would be Adamick against Karen Wakefield in the semifinals. And Adamick built up a big lead early, three strikes in the first four frames. She led by more than 20 through most of the match. She moved on to the finals. Wakefield finished third, tying her best finish ever. It would be Adamick against number one qualifier Carol Giannotti for the title. And again, Adamick takes a big early lead. This strike in the sixth, she leads by 30. But Giannotti storms from behind, closes the gap, needs two strikes and one pin to win the match in the final frames. In the 10th, she got the first strike to stay alive. And then in the 11th, set it short. Oh, Giannotti with it. Giannotti wins it 217 to 208. The Australian becomes the first foreign bowler to win a pro title. With bright lights and highlights, this is Bob Dolan reporting for bowling. That's it for this issue of Bowling World. Why not go out to your local neighborhood center and bowl a few games this week and enjoy the world of bowling. So long until next week. Bowling World.